Back in April of this year, Valve released a presentation from CSGO developer Got Got I'm Gotham Bubber. Gotham Bub Bub I'm Gotham Bubber. Valve released a presentation from a CSGO developer titled Let Updates Do the Talking. It was released as part of the Steamworks conference for developers, and the talk is about how the Counter-Strike dev team's approach to communication has allowed CSGO to grow and maintain its popularity in the nine years since its release. But if you scroll down, just, just past the title of the video, you'll see that <laughs> not everyone agrees. Why is that? Well, there's a lot of reasons, but let's just start by going step by step with our friend Gotham Bubber, and let's see what he has to say. CSGO is a game with over 20 million monthly players. So here's another fun statistic about CSGO's player base. On an average day, Europeans make up over 50% of the global player base for CS. China's perfect world servers, which either appropriately or ironically are separate from the rest of the matchmaking system, that's the next largest majority at somewhere around 10-12%. to 12%. You might assume that the matchmaking algorithms for ranked competitive account for this disparity, but to the best of my knowledge, Valve have never really addressed it. In 2015, there was a global rank reset to adjust the rank distributions so that the peak of the bell curve sat at around Gold Nova 4. But if you look here at the rank distributions for a region like Russia and then compare that to a region with a lower player count, say North America for example, you'll notice on this graph that the bell curve isn't a bell curve. As a result of this, matchmaking in North America is bizarre, especially in the lower ranks like Silver. You'll get new players with 100 hours just trying to figure out the game. You'll get people like me who are more experienced but I don't really play as often, so my rank is still pretty low. And then sometimes you'll get absolutely demolished by Gold Nova 4s, or you'll post 180R over Legendary Eagles. Matchmaking is a meme, and there's no incentive for anyone playing at a high level to play it. Which is why more skilled players tend to flock to third-party services like Faceit or ESEA. Vu on YouTube actually came out with a very good video recently talking more about this problem in North America. It's... it's pretty not good. Anyway, back to you, Gotham. We think CSGO is better when we get clear, unfiltered customer feedback. We read and analyze this feedback our customers post on various online communities, but as they know, we rarely participate in those conversations. When we participate, they stop talking to each other and they start talking to us, and the feedback becomes less clear. Occasionally, we weigh in if they seem blocked or we need some more information, but otherwise, we just stay out of it. In reality, when customers want to talk to us, it's because they're unhappy with something about the service. What he's describing here is actually a real issue with customer feedback. If you order a pizza, for example, and it arrives with the wrong toppings, you'll probably call up to the pizza place to complain. If your pizza arrives as expected and everything's fine, uh, you, just, you just enjoy the pizza and they'd never hear from you again unless you order another pizza later. But somehow this analogy feels wrong. Could I get an example? For example, if customers are talking about a bug, the best response we can make is to fix the bug and update the game as soon as possible. We avoid talking about future plans for the game or even how we intend to fix a particular bug because future plans can always change. A bug might require more work than we expected, or a fix may have unexpected consequences. Let's see how this plays out in practice. The bug surfaces. Clips get shared around of the bug happening to various people over time. People in the community try to reproduce the bug, but they can't quite nail it down. It's, it's really finicky. And from the community's perspective, this is where the story of this bug ends. We can only assume that Valve has seen the bug, we can only assume that they've tried to fix it, and we can only assume that fixing this bug had some unintended consequence, or maybe the bug itself is impossibly evasive to narrow down. I, I don't know. Trying to communicate via updates is only really effective when your updates actually happen in like a timely manner. But when it comes to the smoke bug, when it comes to the borked matchmaking in low player regions, the continued demands for better anti-cheat solutions, Overwatch judges having to wade through an endless sea of spin botters, all we've received is radio silence. If your updates are supposed to do the talking and you don't address the issues by not solving them in updates, what exactly are you saying? I mean, as a player, I want to believe that Valve is working on these things, but... When months and years go by with no solutions, the well of belief and hopium starts to come up pretty dry. 
The community's interests change over time as well. If we promised a feature or solution to a problem, we'd constrain what the team could ship and be less responsive to when our priorities or the community's priorities change. In those cases, if we broke our promise or shipped a different solution, even if it took us longer than expected, we would start to erode the trust and possibly lose the opportunity to provide customers with more value. Okay, this might seem like kind of a weird and obtuse statement, but it actually makes more sense once you get an idea of how Valve works as a company. Valve is odd. Employees at Valve don't necessarily get assigned to projects or games like your standard game developer might. Instead, people kind of just work on whatever they feel like. Occasionally, there will be like a big company-wide push for something like Half-Life Alex, but in general, the development teams at Valve are super versatile and super malleable. People hop projects all the time. We in the public can't really see what Valve is working on at any particular time, but if we compare the regularity of significant CSGO updates compared to something like the Steam Store or Dota 2, we can come to the reasonable conclusion that there probably aren't a lot of people working on CSGO right now. I mean, Gaben himself is quoted as saying 20 to 30 people in the past, but how many that is now is anyone's guess. More than TF2, at least. I'm sorry, I like TF2, it's just, it's just too easy. So if you have low manpower, it is very important for you to stay in touch and make sure what you're working on is the right thing at the right time. Fair point. Also, when we make these promises about the future, customers start thinking about the game's future and not how it is now. I can see why you'd want to be cautious about this, but you don't have to make promises or even address the future. In many cases, saying something as simple as, we are aware of this issue and we're examining our options can go a long way. Psst, hey, don't tell Valve this, but they actually already do this for server outages. Even if in the end you can't deliver on a good solution, you can still say we haven't figured it out and we're still looking into it. People will appreciate that more than nothing in the end. It's easy to imagine how you might communicate about your product when things are going well. But with any games as a service, you have to plan for some challenging times, and CSGO is no exception. So we tend to think about the communication strategies we would use during those challenging times. In those times, we don't think we could make customers happy just by talking to them. We'd have to ship them updates and fix the issues. It's true. The community would not just be satisfied by blog posts in place of actual content updates. But does that necessarily mean they aren't worth doing at all? But let's look at the other side of the coin. Here's a recent thread from the Valorant subreddit, I know, Valorant lol, where the community is voicing their concern about a recent lack of communications from Riot. There's some speculation, there's a bit of salt, but look at this, look at this right here. A response from one of the developers talking about the issue. Note that their response is hitting some of the same notes that Gotham was talking about. Unintentional expectations. Now, I haven't played Valorant since the beta ended, but seeing this makes me more jealous than any in-game feature like higher server tick rates or better anti-cheat. And it's not like the CSGO devs are impossible to contact either. They're around, they lurk on the subreddit, and sometimes they even say things. But 95% of the time, their message is, hey, do you have more information you could give us about this bug? Which isn't really like a bad thing to say, but if that's your only response on a popular thread asking about more intrusive anti-cheat, you're kind of just dodging the question. Don't get me wrong, I have no doubt that people behind the scenes at Valve have been hard at work at improving VAC, and maybe they even have data that shows that VAC is very effective at catching cheaters, but until they can present that to the community and prove beyond a reasonable doubt, see what I did there, that VAC and Overwatch are getting the job done, the players will only have their own personal experiences to rely on, and a lot of them are not happy. Now because we don't regularly communicate outside the context of updates, what goes in each update is just as important and it tells everyone what we think is important about the game. Our goal is that updates reflect the conversations our customers are having, and they communicate what we think is important for the long-term success of the game. Where's the three clicks fill up music kit, Valve? It's free money, free money. We learn from CSGO-focused communities, as well as other communities where CSGO users go and talk to customers about it. That feedback, is great at pointing out pain points in the game experience. But when it comes to finding solutions or even the underlying problems to those pain points, analyzing player behavior is our most useful tool. We collect data on a wide range of player behaviors, including time spent in different game modes, weapon usage, 
in connectivity to our data centers, ever since we launched back in 2012, this combination of feedback and analytics has helped us prioritize our updates. Okay, some credit to Valve here. There are a lot of instances where this system is clearly effective. He points out the 2012 matchmaking rework, which is a good example. Most recent cases I'd point out are the Deagle nerf and the M4A1S buffs, which the community had been talking about for quite a while. It's good stuff. But there also have been a lot of moments that have just left the community outright confused. For example, what exactly was the goal of the Negev changes? I mean, even after slashing the price to 1700 and giving it that weird delayed laser beam spray, it's still a, a meme weapon. Like, even more so now. Did you want people to consider it as a viable buy option? I mean, I'm not saying it'll never happen. The SG went under the radar for years before people realized how good that was. But is this mission accomplished for the Negev? And while I'm on the topic, why is the M249 $5,000? Can you at least make it like 3000 so I can meme on people without having to empty my savings account? And I know, I know it was years ago, but I'd be remiss not to mention... You get one shot somebody with a fucking pistol! Like, how, how did that happen? How did that happen? <laughs> Let's talk about maps. CSGO is a subset of maps called the Active Duty Pool. Seven maps that are standard for the competitive game mode. If you watch professional CSGO teams play, these are the maps that you'll see. So naturally there's a lot of discussion about what maps should be added or removed from the pool, and sometimes it just feels like Valve go completely rogue and make changes just because they feel like it. Y'all want to add Anubis? Great! Here's a new map called Ancient, you will play it now. Oh, you think Mirage is overdue for a remake? Hey, you know what? We'll do you one better. Here's a remake of Vertigo. Oh, you guys want some adjustments for Cobblestone? How about we replace the A bomb site with an actual pile of garbage? I will never forgive you for this va- I'm sorry, I just... I used to really like Cobblestone. What I think is really peculiar about all this is Valve rarely states the intentions of their updates. Sometimes they really are simple enough to speak for themselves, sometimes not so much. And obviously they don't want to be prescriptive, and they don't have to tell us exactly what drives them to make their decisions, but when you provide zero explanations for things like Cobblestone's A changes and then leave the map to suffer in Wingman Purgatory, what, what am I supposed to think? Sometimes it feels like Counter-Strike isn't succeeding because of Valve, but in spite of it. Even though the global player count is as good as it's ever been, basically, a lot of people feel estranged from this game that they love. When Valve are really in lockstep synchronization with the community's wants and needs, the hype in the community is palpable. But when they're out of sync and the fridge gift starts to creep in on the update threads, that's when people start to go a little mad with hunger. I know they don't want me thinking about the future of the game and thinking about the present instead, but we're nine years into CSGO. Source 2 at this point has basically become Counter-Strike's Dire Tide. Except Dota got Dire Tide multiple times. And I know it's popular to say, oh, Source 2 won't just magically make the game better, which is true, but it will get the game off of DirectX 9. We don't even have that backported Vulcan support that Portal 2 and Half-Life 2 got, like what? The recent Major sold out the Avicii Arena on a graphics API old enough to be enlisted in the military. That's not dedication. That's Stockholm Syndrome. Boom, shut it down.